Well, good morning, everyone. Once again, welcome to Cosmic Coffee coming to you live from Lowell Observatory. I'm Jeff Hall, an astronomer and the director of the observatory. And I'm here this week with our historian, uh, Kevin Schindler. Welcome, Kevin, to the show. Hey, Jeff. So today, as usual, we're going to do a little shout out to one of Flagstaff's fine coffee shops. And we talked about this a bit a few minutes ago, and we're, we're urging everybody to go check out Dottie's Garden Coffee House, which is over at Warner's Nursery there on Butler serving, among other things, Matador coffee, so you can support two shops in one that way. Um, please do continue to get out and support our local businesses as they get back up and running. Now, it's kind of a, a special day here at Lowell. Um, the observatory is 126 years old, but as it turns out, this is the 124th anniversary of Percival Lowell's 24-inch Alvin Clark refractor. Um, and I've got an image of the old refractor here as my virtual background. And um, Kevin, our historian, is going to be telling us all about the history of this venerable instrument. He's here with us live, but we're going to begin with a quick uh, video greeting from him, and then we'll switch to the live show. So uh, we can run the video. Here we are at the historic 24-inch refracting telescope at Lowell Observatory built by Alvin Clark and Sons, 32 feet long, 24 inches in diameter, one of the best telescopes of this type ever made and used. And this is a great place to talk about planetary work because this exquisite instrument allowed Percy Lowell and other astronomers here at the Observatory to really unravel some of the mysteries of the universe. Uh, Percy Lowell first got this telescope in 1896. Two years after he opened the observatory here, he had borrowed a couple of telescopes initially until he could have this masterpiece built. And you know, we look at it today, and it, it really is a piece of art, but it also is such an important piece of astronomical history um, because of so much research that was done with it. Okay, so now we will switch over to the live uh, Kevin Schindler, and we're going to go through the, the history of this instrument. It's it's really pretty substantial. You know, if you were actually sitting in the Clark Dome and, and looking at me and the telescope behind me, it would look something like that. This is a pretty substantial undertaking. So, Kevin, let's start with the sort of the origin of, of this instrument and what, what drove Percival Lowell to such a, a massive undertaking. Sure, Jeff. Let me uh, start a PowerPoint program here. And get her started. I, I thought um, I should start with this picture since we're talking about Percival Lowell. This is where I'm sitting. Um, this is a historic picture of Percival Lowell's library in what we call today affectionately the White House after Nat White and his family who lived here for a long time. So this is where I'm sitting today just as Percival Lowell would have um, a bit more than a century ago today. So you know, we talk about Lowell Observatory, the story starts with this guy. Um, Percival Lowell was very interested in studying Mars and the possibility of intelligent life there. He was inspired by Giovanni Schiaparelli's drawings starting in 1877, showing these supposed linear features that um, Schiaparelli called Canali. Percival Lowell and others believe these to be, um, you know, made by some sort of intelligent life. Nothing in nature could be this linear so it must have been made by some sort of intelligent life. So in 1894, uh, Percival Lowell borrowed a couple telescopes, one from Harvard and one from John Brashear, a telescope maker in Pennsylvania. And they put them inside this dome, which is on the exact site of the Clark Dome today. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that later on. So they used these telescopes uh, for a couple of years, but Percival Lowell really wanted a big telescope, his own telescope, he could afford it. So we laid down $20,000 and worked with uh, these gentlemen, Elvin Clark and Sons, were the best telescope makers of their time. Uh, Percival Lowell wanted the best, he could afford it. And so he um, contracted with them to build this telescope that would allow him to see Mars close up. Of course, later on, he studied a lot more things than Mars, but that was initially his, his big thing. And so, he um, purchased this telescope, and this is what it looked like not too long after he purchased it. Um, this is down in Mexico, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So, so it was really going back to his desire um, to prove 
the um, existence of intelligent life on Earth that he that he got this telescope in the first place. Okay, and so having made that decision in a rather substantial outlay of money that would I know would translate to millions of dollars today um, if you you know inflate it over more than a century. Um, so let's let's talk about the particular type of telescope and and the dome as well, which has its own interesting history. Sure. Let me start a little bit with the dome. Um, this is 1896, and this picture is in downtown Flagstaff, an empty lot that was owned by um, the Sykes brothers. They were bicycle repairmen in town. First of all, Lowell hired them to build his dome because the sign above their door said, makers and menders of anything. He said, well, a telescope dome is anything, build me a dome. And so they built the, the top portion of this at their lot in downtown Flagstaff. Um, and then they put that as well as the new telescope on a train in pieces, took them down to Mexico because there's gonna be a good opposition to Mars, but they had to go to more southerly location to see it up in the sky high enough. Um, so here, here is the dome being constructed or being erected um, near Mexico City, and then the finished dome, and you can see the telescope sticking out of it. So when they first finished the telescope, um, in 1896, they brought it here to Flagstaff to test it in that old dome. Um, and it was so big, it actually stuck out the doors of that dome. But they tested it, then took it apart um, and put it in the, in the dome pieces onto that train, took them down to Mexico and re reassembled them. And I make this sound really easy. Uh, they just took it down, put it back up. But you think this thing is 40 feet tall. The telescope is 32 feet long, thousands of pounds. Um, that was quite the undertaking without cranes or modern equipment to lift it. So it, it wasn't as easy as I make it sound. Um, so, so they used the telescope down in Mexico for a bit. And then they brought it back to Flagstaff in 1897. And this is where that dome originally sat, the, the original dome with the borrowed telescopes. And if you look closely, um, there's a tree on the left, and the tree on the right, and this one in the upper right corner. Um, when they brought the telescope back from Mexico, they had by this point gotten rid of this smaller dome. They erected the Clark Dome here, and you can see it's on the same site. They had to do a little tree trimming, but it's on the same site. And this is where it still sits today. So, you know, you think this is 1897 when it was erected permanently here. That was years before Arizona was even a state. So, you know, you think about the development of Arizona and Flagstaff and Little Observatory, we've all grown up together, um, which is, I think, kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then a couple of years later, they, they took the canvas off the dome. The original topping was canvas to help the temperature inside and outside equalize as best as possible. Um, but, you know, Mexico doesn't have snow like we have in Flagstaff. Um, they needed a more substantial roof, so they, um, you can see on the left side, the canvas is coming off, and here it is, the wood put, being put on, and then they covered that with metal um, to what the dome is today. Um, so that's the dome part of it. Um, and it's, I think it's interesting to talk about the dome and telescope. Obviously, they go together, but also, but also they're two different things. The dome in itself is, a, is an interesting architectural um, masterpiece, really, something that's still being used today. Um, now, the telescope itself, this is what it looks like today. This is a picture taken by Don Kish, a photographer in town. Just, I think it really captures the majesty of the telescope. Um, and this is taken right after we did the renovation a few years ago. Um, it, it's just, this is one of the most important telescopes in American history, if not the world. And yet it's also a piece of art. I mean, this is just an exquisite instrument. Um, it's, a, it's a type of telescope called a refractor which uses lenses to focus the light. Light passes through the lenses and the lenses refract or bend the light at the focus, as opposed to most modern research telescopes, which use large mirrors and those mirrors reflect the light, bounce the light back and forth. So this is one of the larger refracting types ever, refracting type telescopes ever built. Um, the, the light, you would point it at something in the sky, the light comes through the lenses, which are at the far end, travel 30, the light travels 32 feet till it comes to a focus. 
right down here at the eyepiece. And if you're, if you're gonna take pictures with this or use a spectrograph like VM Cipher did, you take this whole eyepiece assembly off and then and put your instruments on there. Um, so that's how you'd use it. I think for me, one of the spectacular things about this is not only all the research that it was used for, but how we use this um, for public education. And we're not at this very minute, but still for, for decades, this has been an important tool for inspiring people about the universe. Um, so I think that's really you know, a pretty neat thing. Um, I, I wanted to mention one other thing about the telescope that I think is interesting. You know, you think about looking through the eyepiece and the, eye, the height of the eyepiece is gonna change depending on what you're looking at in the sky. The lower on the horizon something is, the higher the eyepiece is gonna be. And so sometimes if you're looking at something really low, like Percival Lowell is here, um, you had to climb a ladder. And so this is one of the ladders they had. This is down in Mexico before it came back. Um, well, imagine what OSHA would say today if you use this kind of ladder and, and imagine you're in the dark because you have to be observing in the dark. And so um, this is another telescope ladder they use not for very much. And really, you're not going to look at something that's across on the horizon very often. But this is just so precarious looking. Um, and this is, this is if, you, if you visit the observatory in modern times, this ladder is the one that's still sitting there. This is a picture of Percival Lowell 1914 um, in, in a kind of a safer ladder, I guess. So there, there's so much great history about the telescope, but we're just glossing over it. But I think these are a couple of the interesting um, highlights about it. Yeah, and that last picture is a little closer to the kinds of precarious situations we try to put our visitors in. We, we try not to pick objects that have everybody 15 feet in the air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have a little movable ladder and occasionally, pe occasionally people have to climb up um, a few steps. Uh, there's one question in the chat feed asking about the telescope's maximum magnification. Well, I mean, you could magnify, you could magnify more than a thousand times with it, but you're not going to really see anything. Um, so when, when, when Lowell was looking at Mars, well, let me go back. When we view with that for the public, we'll typically look at something like maybe 300 times. And that gives us a good magnification. Magnifying higher than that, you're also magnifying the distortion of the atmosphere. And so the more you magnify, the more disturbance you get. And so when Lowell was looking at something like Mars, he would magnify six or 800 times, but he would have to wait for those moments, just quick moments of exquisite seeing and then record the details. So typically viewing today, we'll do 300 times or so with the public. They would go up to several hundred or even a thousand, but you got to an upper limit where it's like a lot of telescopes you buy in the store, um, you know, just off the shelf things, you can magnify all this time and well, that's good, but you're really not getting anything when you get to a certain point. Right. In fact, I was I was going to specifically mention that I always kind of wince when we you know, you're in a department store and, and you'll see an off the shelf telescope. And typically, you know, to be affordable, they're very small apertures. They might be 50 or 60 millimeter refractors. And these giant, you know, magnifies 880X on the on the box. And, you know, with that small uh, light gathering capacity and that much magnification, I mean, you can't look at anything. And so yeah. it's pretty misleading advertising. And really, the, one, the, the powerful aspect of this telescope is not so much its magnification, but its aperture, as you pointed out, being one of the larger refractors, it just gathers a lot of light. And so, you know, we can look at a globular star cluster or something with pretty faint stars, and right. it's just like a million uh, diamonds there in the field of view. So, so yeah, good question. Um, and, and this kind of telescope, a refractor, Percival Lowell specifically wanted because refractors have historically been considered a little bit better for detecting planetary detail um, on planets, which of course is what Percival Lowell wanted. Right, so that of course was the original purpose, but you mentioned um, that whole eyepiece assembly can come off if we wanna repurpose the telescope for doing research, which it certainly has done over the years. So let's, let's I mean, you know, Lowell died in 1916 and now we're more than a century on. So let's cover right. all the things this instrument's done. Well, you know, we, you know, like I said before, it all starts with Percival Lowell, and I think this is a kind of a humorous slide. Um, Percival Lowell 
was an intense person, but he also had a good sense of humor. For one of his birthdays, um, his staff here at the observatory gave him this picture. And this is one of his illustrations of Mars showing all these linear features, all these supposed canals, which we know today don't even exist. There are some sort of optical aberration, but there's a little picture of Percival Lowell digging his garden and the caption on the picture said, Percival Lowell digging canals on Mars. And so um, I think it's just a humorous thing because that telescope is mostly associated with Lowell's study of Mars. Um, and this kind of captures it, but, but there, there is so much more that was done um, through the years. Um, E.C. Slifer, who Percival Lowell hired from Indiana University along with his brother, um, he used the telescope and, and this is one of his cameras, if you can imagine, um, the, the telescope or this camera would load onto the telescope on the left side and on the right side is this little carriage that hold, would hold a glass plate. The plate is like a, like a piece of film, is glass. And that's how you would take pictures and E.C. Slifer at one point took more pictures of Mars and other planets than anybody else in the world. And in fact, we really owe him a debt of gratitude today because, because um, the, the method of image stacking was just sort of developing. And E.C. Slifer was really one of the first people to adapt this to astronomy. Um, and, and of course, image stacking today is, is fundamental to um, so much imaging, not just astronomical and astrophotography, but general photography also. So, so Mars studies continued well after Percival Lowell um, with E.C. Slifer um, and others. Uh, Percival Lowell and E.C. Slifer and V.M. Slifer and others studied a lot of planetary things, things in our solar system. And this is a classic picture from 1910. And this was taken with a camera mounted on top of the telescope actually. And in, in this, these days that we're appreciating Comet Neowise, this is um, Halley's Comet 1910. And this is, this is a classic picture that used to show up in textbooks all the time because it shows not only Halley's Comet in the middle, but the planet Venus, which Percival Lowell and VM Slifer used this telescope to help determine uh, the rotation period of Venus. It also has the city lights of Flagstaff in the lower left and even a meteor shooting through the field of view of the comet. Um, so that it, it's really uh, captures a lot in that picture. So they did a lot of solar system research. Um, you know, the, the most, arguably the most important research done at the observatory, um, certainly one of the most fundamental to astronomy was the work of VM Slifer. Um, Percival Lowell wanted him to study these fuzzy things in space that Percival Lowell and others thought might be young planetary systems being formed. And so Lowell said, use this new spectrograph, which will allow, allow us to look at the composition of, of what you're looking at and see if the composition matches that of like Jupiter and Saturn. If it does, then maybe those things really are young planets. Well, VM Slifer found that they didn't match, but something he found is these fuzzy blobs were moving at incredible speeds, mostly away from us. And that was the first detection of the expanding nature of the universe, which Edwin Hubble later um, based a lot of his um, ideas on what VM Slifer had found. And then e evolving from that came the um, expanding universe uh, model. And then from that, the Big Bang Theory. And I, I have to point out, you know, I think one of the interesting things about Lowell Observatory is our remarkable history of science but also our place in pop culture, because the observatory has been featured through the years on so much educational programming and, and other things. Um, so I wanted to bring attention to this because um, several years ago, there's the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. And in the first season, if you look closely, there's a poster on the door and that's the Clark Telescope. That's our telescope. That's Leonard Martin, who is an astronomer here, a Mars astronomer. Um, and so the first season, so, you know, the, this telescope, when you start looking at it, it really has appeared in so many ways. It's been used for so much research, um, but also has appeared um, in so many other ways in pop culture. And another thing that, that is science, but also 
transcend since the public is are the Apollo missions of the 1960s. And the telescope for nine years was used to make detailed maps of the moon, which the astronauts could then use to figure out where to land and such. Um, and these maps were just exquisite um, based on, you know, prior images of the moon and then uh, observers looking through the eyepiece and artists sketching in the details. And so, so this was the last major research done with the telescope. There's some other stuff done, but you think about Percival Lowell's Mars research, uh, the recession of velocity work, um, the, the moon mapping. Um, and of course, one thing we should probably mention is Pluto. Um, this is not the telescope used to discover Pluto. We, we just have a bounty of, of telescopes up here. That's a different telescope. Although the Clark was used um, in some of the early searches for this planet. And also um, after Saitama discovered Pluto here in 1930 with a different telescope, he and other astronomers went to the Clark. Now that they know, knew where to look, they could zoom in with the Clark telescope and you know, see if they could see any um, moons or planetary detail or so on, um, which they didn't, which we know today because it was so small and far away. But, but anyways, it, it played a part in that, but it's secondary. So really quite an impressive heritage of research. Yeah, quite a broad heritage. And, and you're certainly right about the artistic aspect of it. I mean, those, the moon maps are just stunning <laughs> what they what they produced, um, not only the, the, the accuracy, but just the, the beauty of them and what they were able to translate from the, the telescope onto paper. And you think about, you know, they did it to where not only were they capturing the details, but at a certain time of the sun angle coming across, which would match when the astronauts would be going. So they, so it would look exactly the same. I mean, it, it's really, it really is artwork. And it was artists who were doing those maps. You yeah. think today about our high resolution imaging, um, but this is a different era. But if you compare the maps they made by hand to the modern imaging, they nailed it. I mean, it's remarkable how accurate they were. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the same can be said, of course, of, you know, Slifer's initial set of velocities, which um, not only took incredible care, but incredible patience and persistence. And, and then, of course, it all goes back to um, you're, you're talking about art and precision and how well they did with the moon maps, but all the way back to the start, you know, the quality of the lenses um, that Alvin Clark uh, made is just astounding. They're, they're, they're perfectly figured. And so the image quality that this telescope delivers is fabulous. Um, and, and, you know, on that note, um, back in, gosh, in the 19 teens, um, I, a group did a series of Hartman tests. Hartman tests uh, evaluated the quality of, of refracting, of lenses of refracting telescopes. So they looked at the um, Yerkes, 40 inch and the Lick's 36 inch and, and Lowell's 24 inch and others. And, and the one here rated as the best of all those. So we're talking about the Cadillac of telescopes. And then this was the very best of all of them, which is pretty remarkable. Yep. yep. And, and, you know, a more, a more modern um, Cadillac, of course, is sort of the, the bookend telescope to this one, which is the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And I had the same feeling when, with the first time we, uh, we had the primary mirror delivered to the site back in 2010, um, and it was first uh, illuminized. And you just looked at that surface, and and I had this feeling it was equal parts, you know, engineering and mathematics because it's a, a very slight hyperbola uh, figured to precisions of nanometers, and just art. I mean, it's just beautiful to look at that that perfectly curving surface. Um, uh, just. Fabulous, fabulous stuff that goes into these tools of our trade. I think it goes back to that idea that Percival Lowell and Albert Einstein and others pushed that, you know, in life and in science specifically, but in life, you can succeed with knowledge, but there's also a certain bit of inspiration and um, that other factor that, that allows you to really create something. Um, Absolutely. And, and it's certainly you capture that well is our director is both a scientist and an artist, that you really use both sides of your brains um, in creating things. And I, I think these telescopes are perfect examples of that. You do. And, and there's definitely, you know, you think of science as a, a purely 
uh, deliberate, careful, logical process, which it certainly is, but there's that element of judgment and art and creativity mm -hmm. and just thinking of something nobody had ever thought of before. I mean, it's like, you know, Galileo having the idea that light could be something that had a speed or Einstein having the idea that time may actually not pass inflexibly, you know, the kind of creative brain it takes to come up with something like that and then render it into the mathematics that correctly describes the phenomena. Yeah. It's, it's an integral part of what we do. Yeah. Well, and so, and of course, um, as you pointed out, um, you, you know, Lowell has been uh, an inspiration to a lot. We factored a lot in pop culture. And so over the years, um, the Clark has kind of morphed into principally a, a, a tool for public education and, and inspiration, which is a critical part of our mission. So let's talk a little about that. Right. Well, you know, the moon mapping took place in the 60s, and there was still some research being done with the telescope. But, you know, as Flagstaff grew, we got some more, some more city lights, and, and that comes with a really big asterisk. Because even though the city grew, we, we also remember that the first lighting ordinance in the world was right here in Flagstaff. And that ties in with, with the observatory, because we are getting a, a new telescope from Ohio um, to supplement the telescope we had already. And the astronomer said, well, we can put this outside of town by Lake Mary, but there are some spotlights that might, you know, shine up in the sky. And so the city created an ordinance that limited the, the use of those. And that was the world's first lighting ordinance. And, and, and today Flagstaff, of course, is a model for um, controlling light pollution. Um, but, but be that as it may, as the community grows, you're still gonna get more car lights and so on. And so this telescope wasn't being used as much for research because we're right over downtown. And so we started using it more and more for education. The education goes back to Percival Lowell's day. Um, as soon as he had the telescope set up, they would put article or little ads in the newspaper, the Coconino Sun, as it was called, um, come up Saturday night for telescope viewing. So Percival Lowell really promoted this idea of sharing science with the public. And that's something, of course, we take seriously today. So, so in, in recent years, um, in, the, in the 1980s and, and really exploding in the 90, 1990s, we welcomed more and more people um, to, to share the excitement of, of space. Um, with daytime tours, like is shown here, um, with telescope viewing at night, where people can make their own discoveries of the universe. So that's something we continue today. And I don't know, of all the things I've been fortunate enough to do at the observatory, there's nothing like standing at a telescope like the Clark and seeing somebody look through an eyepiece of the telescope for the first time. And, you know, for that moment, it's just them and the telescope. And they're making that discovery themselves just like Percival Lowell did, just like we all have. And it, it, it still makes me a little misty eyed <laughs> how much impact that can have on people. And so that's a huge, you know, that's what the, the, the telescope's legacy today, this remarkable research, research that was done. And then, you know, the public education, the ability to inspire people from around the world. And this inspiration comes from not only them visiting, but, you know, so much educational programming has done, been done with the telescope. Going back to some of the earliest programming of Walt Disney in the 1950s, when Disney Company came here, they interviewed E.C. Slifer in a program about Mars that also included um, Werner von Braun, the father of American rocketry and others. Um, so going back to the 1950s, um, of course, Carl Sagan's classic Cosmos series, and this is a little fuzzy because this is a still from one of the Cosmos original episodes, um, Blues for a Red Planet. This is Sagan inside the dome. Um, the fellow on the left is, is Leonard Nimoy, who in the late 1990s was doing a, a, a science program interviewing Carolyn Shoemaker, um, who's still here in Flagstaff. Uh, she and her husband are legends in the astronomy field. Um, later on, here's uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, with some really sketchy Shady. character. Character. Because the Indians are actually the World Series. Um, so Bill Nye, the science guy, 
um, and getting some more times and to include um, everybody in this conversation. Ira Flatow years ago um, was here to do a Science Friday and the event wasn't actually at the telescope. It was, it was uh, down on campus of NAU, but he was up here um, with, of course, you, Jeff. Um, Another dubious character. And yeah, and so we've had, we've had all this educational programming and that, that gets word out to countless people around the world. But we also, because of the importance of the observatory and the telescope, we've had visitors from um, when Hillary Clinton was first lady, um, not to exclude other party members. Here's John McCain a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. again with a sketchy guy. Mm -hmm. And so politicians, um, um, celebrities like Brian May of, of, the, of Queen, who is also has a PhD in astrophysics. Um, and you know you've made it big if the Wienermobile yep. has been up here um, to visit. So, Clearly the most distinguished visit to the facility. Yes. Of the so, you know, you think this is, you know, I think the Clark really to me represents Little Observatory and that we have this remarkable heritage of science, but we're also so embedded as a cultural icon. Um, and it's this combination of the two, you know, the cultural is based on the scientific, but they feed off each other. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that, you know, it's part of the, the magic of Little Observatory, I think. Absolutely. And, and you're, I particularly picked up on your point about the person looking through the telescope and feeling like they're making their own personal discovery. And, and that, that's a point that our trustee Lowell Putnam makes repeatedly, that he, he will quote Percival Lowell as saying that part of research and part of discovery is engaging the public and making them uh, feel like they are co-discoverers of, of, of what you're doing. And, and certainly we, we still do that today. But Time marches on and things gradually wear out. And, you know, as you pointed out in the 1990s, we really started ramping up our visitor program, particularly with the opening of the Steel Visitor Center in 1994. And so this old telescope started getting used really hard night in and night out. And by 2014, it was, it was time for some TLC. Right. It, it had like you said, it had been used night in and night out um, a lot. And it got to the point where, you know, you move the telescope by hand still, you push it by hand. And when we moved it in a certain direction, you hear this loud clunk <laughs> up somewhere in the gears of the telescope. And let me tell you how unnerving that was when you're standing underneath this multi-thousand pound thing and you think, you know, all, all machines eventually break down and, you know, it's not like it's going to fall down, but still you hear this big clunk and that's a little unnerving. And then, you know, the entire, the entire telescope and, and, the, and the dome itself just, you know, needing major work. Um, and so we um, were able to get funding to renovate it. And, and once they took all the parts off and everything, they found Ralph Nye, who was head of this project, this is the main bearing wheel of the telescope. And you can see the top of this, how corroded it is. And that's what happened when, when, the, when this was moving, spinning around, when it came in contact with this part, it, that's when it, you got that big clunk. But they couldn't tell this because it was covered up with all sorts of other stuff. And so this was, this was just a neat project because you think this telescope hadn't been, it was installed in 18, 97 um, here in Flagstaff in this dome and that and it hadn't been out since then and so using cranes um, and some ingenuity um, they took it apart piece by piece and then here's the mount being lifted out with some of the counterweights um, they took all this stuff out um, every screw every part um, every layer of paint they looked at um, rebuilt refurbished um, fixed the, whole, the entire thing, just as a couple of examples of then and now, here's um, one of the wheels on the top and the bottom when it's renovated, you can see what a difference that makes when you really clean it up and, and how much better it's gonna work. I, I would argue the telescope probably works better than maybe when it did when it was first built because using modern 
understanding of, of machines, you can make it work a little bit better. I think that's a fair statement, yeah. And then, of course, the final product is this, you know, before the renovation, you would walk into the dome and it was, you know, you look around and it's stunning. But afterwards, I don't know, like we said, it's, it's like you're looking at a masterpiece. And I, one of the things that I find that just still gives me the chills is taking a group in the dome and then just like you're going to a place like the Lincoln Memorial or something like that, you know, so often people start whispering because it's this reverential experience. You're in this amazing building, um, this, this telescope that really does shine. And it really feels like you're in the presence of, of something remarkable, which you are. And so it just, it just is a neat, a really neat feel, I think, that you get, that you get from it. It truly is. And, and again, we come back once again to the idea of true artists, you know, not just superb engineers, but Ralph and his team are also artisans. The, the, the knobs they designed and the parts they machined are, are not only functional, but beautiful to look at. Um, and, you know, I've been um, over the past couple of years consulting with the folks at Yerkes who are working on getting Yerkes back up and running after it separated from uh, U Chicago. And they have a 40 inch Clark. And, you know, who were they going to call when they needed some advice and information about Clark refractors? You know, arguably the world authority is uh, Ralph, of course, is now retired from Lowell. But, um, yeah, his 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 knowledge of these instruments uh is exceeded by none. <laughs> and I, you know, I just saw this great comment that just came in. Um, I definitely get the vibe. It's like a cathedral to the cosmos. And I think that's just, that's just really beautiful. It, it really, it really is. And, you know, when you come in at night and all the other lights are down, there's just some, some red lights that add a little bit more mystery. Um, it's just such a provocative experience to stand there and look at it and to look you know, the title of this program was Percival Lowell's Time Machine because that's what we're looking at. Right. The way something is, the, the older, the longer it's taken for the light to get to us. And to, to stand alone, um, you can be surrounded by people, but you're still looking through that piece. You're standing alone, just you and that object. And it, it really is a magical experience. Yeah, and with, with I, I think that's uh, a cathedral to the cosmos is a beautiful way of putting it. I mean, I've got my background on, but I'm, I'm sitting in my office. I can see the dome right up the hill here through the trees. And, and it, it really does, it, it really is a monument to our, our field of study. Um, and, you know, by extension, Mars Hill, um, with, with all that has transpired here over the last century and a quarter, I mean, I'm, I've told this story before, but I'm sitting here in this office right in the spot where Clyde Tombaugh walked in 90 years ago when VM Slifer was director and said, Dr. Slifer, I have found your planet X and I, I'm getting goosebumps right now because I, I can't even think of that story without, it, you know, thinking about the significance of it and, and everything that's transpired here and at that, that dome up the hill. Um, we're, we're lucky to be here. And, and you know, we talk about that. You're talking about, you know, the discovery of Pluto and we've been talking about the history of the Clark Telescope. And it really, it lulls one of those places it's not just seeing it, it's a feel you get. Mm -hmm. But it's not just this historic stuff because you know the Clark Telescope is an instrument of yesteryear, but we have the same thing today, um, the same magic of, of today with this telescope. And I think this is a good um, image to end with. And maybe something you can speak a little bit, Jeff, about of, how the, you know, the Clark Telescope, we've just been waxing about what a piece of art it is. And, and of course, the science that was done with it, um, but it, it's, it's the foundation for what we have today. And, you know, lots of similarities, lots of differences, but the Lowell Discovery Telescope carries on that tradition of both science and, you know, the, the sort of magic of it all. Absolutely. And, and you know, this, I, I think, you know, we take people out to for tours of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. I mean, not regularly. It's pretty remote. It's, it's not set up as a public site. But when you you walk up the stairway and emerge into the dome, it, it's it's another one of those cathedral like like feelings. And, and 
you know, any of the great tools of our trade, you get the same feeling walking onto the observing floor, say, of the 200 inch at Palomar, and just, oh my gosh. Um, so here you have, you know, obviously a considerably more modern um, telescope. You know, I, I could go on for for hours about all, all the systems. We talked a little bit before about the, not only the beauty, but the, the perfect figuring and functionality of the primary mirror. Uh, you can see the secondary mirror up there at, in, in the top ring, um, the instrument cube at the back. What's a little hard to see is the, the phenomenally sophisticated uh, support system that maintains the perfect shape of the, the primary mirror. You can just barely see the, the housings of the, the lateral supports for the primary mirror. Um, and then I don't know if one's visible. I've, I've told this story maybe before on a Cosmic Coffee. Um, um, oh, and actually Jim Davies has asked a question that sets this up perfectly. Um, and he's referring to the Clark and about the tires in the Clark Dome. So let me just relate one anecdote and Kevin, then I'll let you address this question about the tires in the Clark Dome ever needing to be changed. Um, you can't see here, but the, the whole DCT dome, like the Clark, it rotates with the telescope and it's what we call encoded, meaning it knows where the telescope is. So it rotates automatically as the telescope moves. Um, and there are four huge motors that, that drive the dome on this big circular uh, beam. And if you look carefully, the, the motors turn basically a really high tech tire that's mounted underneath the motor. And these, these rubber tires mount, made up against the, uh, the beam and drive it. And they look in aspect ratio so similar to the old sedan tires in the Clark Dome that I think if, if Percival were standing out at LDT and, and poking around, I mean, he'd be overwhelmed. I think he would be thrilled. But then he'd look at these tires and say, aha, you know, just like I saw back at, at the old facility. Now, of course, it weren't tires in, in Percival's day. Um, um, so let's let's talk about that. And then we'll we'll take some questions here at the end. So Jim Davies, hi, Jim. Jim asks, you know, do we have to change our tires up there at the Clark Dome? And, you know, Hi, Jim. Good to see you. And before I answer that, I just want to mention one thing that, that you said, Jeff. Um, you had mentioned the LDT and then the DCT. And I think it's, you know, this is another great opportunity for us right. um, to let everybody know that um, since the beginning, this was called the Discovery Channel Telescope. Um, Lowell Observatory owns the telescope, but Discovery Channel um, did a lot of initial funding. But we've, we've um, revisited that partnership. And part of, the, part of the partnership is them creating programming. Um, part of the partnership also is modifying the name some so it's clear that it's Lowell's telescope. So it's the Lowell Discovery Telescope, now LDT. So we, we're still you know, mentally transitioning some, but those two are the same telescope. Yeah. Um, now, as, as for the tires in the, in the, in the Clark Dome, um, it's, a, it's kind of a neat thing because I don't know what the average mileage per tire is, you know, spinning the dome around, but but there are three different tires that are affiliated with motors, and those are what drives the dome. And then there's a couple dozen more tires that are just there for support of weight. They just spin around. So those three tires doing the driving, they're the ones that go flat the most. They're not going flat on the tread. They go flat on the sidewall, which is where they're rubbing against a guide um, bar, as it were. And I don't know how long the average, you know, lasts, but it's some number of years. Um, but to change the tire, um, each tire is on its own axle, a Ford axle. And so to change the tire, our, um, our staff, they use a car jack and jack that section of the dome up, take the old tire up, put the new one on. And the tires they're using aren't original Ford tires back, you know, from half a century ago but they're, they're casts of, of tires made out of a company in Texas, I think. So we have some extras so that when we get a flat, then you change them out. So I don't know, I know Jeff Gehring just changed one sometime earlier this year. Um, and so every once in a while, you get to change them. And you know, the tire pressure in the winter, when it's cold, the tire pressure, you know, the tires go down a little bit so the dome moves a little sluggishly, but it's, you know, as near as we can tell, it's the only telescope dome in the world supported by Ford tires. Um, so just another one of those, you know, quirky aspects of the, of the whole facility. 
Yep. And um, so, yeah, if there are any, if there are other questions, um, please type them into the YouTube chat feed and, and they'll come through here to us. Um, Woody Phillips asks, do you ever do tours of uh, the DCT LDT? The answer is, is yes, we do. Um, somewhat infrequently, um, often it's, it's reserved as kind of a, a fairly exclusive thing for some of our uh, generous donors, but we have on, on this or that occasion done um, tours for various groups, you know, some uh, clubs from the Valley or from Phoenix area or from the Verde Valley. Um, you know, we, we've taken city officials and Flagstaff City Council out there to familiarize them with it. And, and one of the coolest things we've been able to do, which we can't do right now, but back, back here at the business end, which is down at the bottom where the instrument suite is mounted, uh, it's actually a cube with five faces so that we can mount five instruments at once and then switch quickly between them using deployable mirrors inside the box. That, that was entirely designed and built here at uh, Lowell Observatory, one of the most complex instrument projects we've ever undertaken. All of those, what we call the instrument ports, are occupied right now, but it, in times in the past when we've had an open port, we put an eyepiece on this puppy and, and actually look through it with four meters of aperture. And it's pretty remarkable. And for my money, the things that are most incredible when you've got that much glass are the nebulae because they trigger the, the cones in your eyes because there's so much light. And you see these vivid uh, green and pink colors uh, coming straight uh, photons from the universe, straight streaming straight into your eyes. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, Jeff, as a, as a final thought on that, because I, I just love the, the continuum of low observatory that connects 100 years ago to today. Um, in, in January 1963, a group of engineers um, visited the observatory on a cold January night to learn about the moon mapping. And this was, this was the second group of Apollo astronauts that included Neil Armstrong. 49 years later, um, he came back and was here to help dedicate what was then called the Discovery Channel Telescope. And then you and others took him out to the telescope and as you were describing, um, took him to the eyepiece um, to look out into space where he had traveled. And you know, you think about the first man looking through at the cosmos is at one of the world's most powerful telescopes. It's, it's again, it gives you chills. Yeah, and that was, it does. And it was only, you know, uh, tragically only three weeks before um, he passed away after due to surgical complications. And, you know, I, I certainly hope it was enjoyable and meaningful for him to come back to where, you know, his career of exploration began. And, you know, he, and he touched on that so nicely in his keynote address that evening, um, sort of, comparing his, his history of exploration and tying it to the, the decades of exploration that this new facility will do. So it was, of course, a tremendous honor and privilege to have him here to celebrate this with us. Mm -hmm. um, well, and there you have the, the stories of uh, Lowell's uh, bookend telescopes. Uh, you can go back, um, I forget exactly which Cosmic Coffee it was, it was maybe a month or so ago. Um, I did a whole uh, show out at DCT and you can get a complete, uh, or LDT, we're still getting that in our brains, um, uh, sort of a walk around of that whole facility. Thanks very much, Kevin, for joining us um, today to do, cover the, the history of the Clark. Uh, very interesting and always appreciate your coming on the show. Um, if you're available and it's not too late, tune in at 8.30 tonight. We will be having a live stream to talk all about Comet Neowise with Lowell Comet expert, Dr. Dave Schleicher. That's 8.30 Mountain, which is gonna be a little Mountain Standard, a little late on the East Coast, 11.30, um, also 8.30 Pacific Daylight Time. And then of course, join us next week for ongoing live streams, including our next episode of Cosmic Coffee. Till then, everybody stay, stay, stay healthy and be well. We'll see you again online soon. <laughs>